Ladies and gentlemen, I am delighted to be with you at Gresham College. Someone who's speaking on Florence Nightingale, as I am, has a lot to say. And so I will try to move through the material quite quickly. And I will even try to leave a few minutes for questions at the end, if, uh, if that happens. So uh, this uh, collected works of Florence Nightingale, primary sources. I've had the pleasure of finding them and reading them. And my material and my analysis is based on this great diversity of sources. Nightingale was a great writer. She left a lot of material. And people kept it because she was important. So we have these, uh, this rich amount of material on uh, primary sources. If you want to know what 16 volumes look like, <laughs> uh, that's what they are. There is also, uh, for people who don't want 16 volumes, there's also a 200-page paperback, which uh, gives some highlights. So on to the subject matter, who she was. Well, you probably know something about her. And her fame came from the Crimean War. Uh, and, of course, she was the major founder of the modern profession of nursing. I'm a social scientist, not a doctor or a nurse, and I got onto it because of her social science work. And she, of course, was the first woman fellow of the Royal Statistical Society, then the London Statistical Society, and she pioneered evidence-based health care. Just enormously important work that uh, has ongoing relevance. And she's the pioneer environmental health specialist. Uh, the, these are points I will be getting back to, obviously. Now, this is actually a, a dust cover from my Crimean War volume, which is about 1,000 pages long. And this gives you a, a very polite, unrealistic view of uh, the uh, Scutari Barrack Hospital. You see the sky. You see, uh, you see air and light. Uh, and of course, uh, the ventilation was appalling. The sewers were overflowing. Uh, Nightingale is there, and uh, this is a lovely scene, but please don't take it too seriously as representative of any reality. Uh, this also is a, a dust cover in my public health care. Again, you see the lady with the lamp, and that lamp, she did go around carrying a lamp, not quite that kind of a lamp, and she used it. Uh, she, she had a rather humble lamp, but uh, she used it to go through the uh, wards and corridors, not just wards, they were in the corridors at night, and later she had a private soldier who had recovered, who would walk behind her carrying it, so she could write letters from dying soldiers to their families back home. So that lady with the lamp image is very real, but it's, uh, it's what she did in the hospitals, that's, it's what she did to clean them up. Uh, the reputation comes from all these wonderful things and these personal contacts and that reputation that she gained, but it's really uh, what she did with the terrible death rates. Death rates per admissions at London teaching hospitals, that is good hospitals, right, the top hospitals, were around 10% when Nightingale opened her school in 1860 at St. Thomas's Hospital. So I'm just giving you that as kind of the background when you see how bad they were in the war hospitals. Well, the civil hospitals were not places you wanted to go either. And in the Crimean War, the hospitals had death rates at 40% and above in the worst period. Horrible, no? Uh, British Army death rate in the Crimean War, that's the overall death rate, not just in hospitals, but just among the soldiers who went, was a 22%. Now you think of all the protest about the deaths of American soldiers in the Vietnam War, at 2.3%. I think we've had some change in the value of the life of the common soldier uh, since then. Well, Nightingale's role, much of it was spent on cleaning up the hospitals. Feces on the floor, that's the F word in my collected works of Florence Nightingale, comes up quite a bit. It's in the uh, government reports, getting supplies in. The, the war office was, was terribly badly organized. They hadn't really fought since uh, they beat Napoleon, and so they weren't up to date. Nightingale got laundries established. Well, the laundresses quit because of the horrible smell. And some laundresses got sick from, from uh, I mean, you know, the, the water would have fleas and lice and feces and vermin and, and uh, not, not anything you want to hear about, but uh, that was the reality. And so that's what Nightingale was faced with when she arrived. And the significant change is she arrived in November. Uh, of 1854, and it wasn't until the Sanitary Commission arrived in March that uh, really the big changes were brought about. So Nightingale saw these terrible conditions, but she also saw the changes that were made when you did the right things. And it was a civilian uh, head, Dr. John Sutherland, 
ed educated at Edinburgh, also had some French experience. And his second was Robert Rawlinson, a civil engineer. They were sent out by Lord Palmerston. They were sent out by the civilian government. The, war, the Army Medical Department, well, they didn't mind, you know, the high deaths rates certainly didn't bother them, but they did, mi they did mind the public, and the Times a newspaper published this widely, and in fact, a government fell, the Aberdeen government fell, and uh, the Palmerston uh, government, which took over, and Lord Palmerston, this is always very handy, was a neighbor of the Nightingales in Hampshire. Sewers and drains, massive cleanup. Nuisance inspectors, what do nuisance inspectors inspect? Well, things that, 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 that kill you, you know, uh, feces, dung, uh, dead rats, you know, all of those things which are quite, uh, quite available. And Liverpool pioneered this cleanup, and Dr. Sutherland had gotten his, his experience in Liverpool. And so when he, and he came over with nuisance inspectors who were civil servants for Liverpool. So they were the best. And I, I keep wanting to emphasize this. You've got to get the top experts. You've got to get the best experience if you want to make changes. And they pioneered these public health measures. They removed dead horses from the water supply, improved ventilation. And uh, the reports are very detailed about the tons of filth. Filth is the code word for feces. Uh, and the number of dead horses that are removed. And they move the burial grounds a little bit further away from the water supply. You know? I mean, it's just, you know, if it's, it's really all quite horrible to read. Now, uh, the point I want to make and spend a little bit of time on is that the British Army had these terrible death rates, but they made changes. They, they made these profound changes, and the French Army did not. Uh, the results in the statistics show overwhelming success uh, for the uh, British Army. And so these, these data comes, uh, come from uh, Jean-Charles Chenu, de la mortalité dans l'armée, uh, and uh, he used British official statistics uh, from the British government, uh, collected by the Army Medical Department, but also uh, the French ones. Now, uh, this very interesting material, and I'm I've got a chart here which I think is really quite fascinating. And you see, uh, the, the British are the red coats, uh, and you can see the first winter of the war, uh, the British the, the British death rate is higher than the French one, French, French blue over there. Well, the French wanted the war. The, the French were the instigators of the war. The French had pioneered military medicine. They were better prepared. So we shouldn't be surprised that the death rates were lower for the French army in the first winter. Aha, uh -huh. but look at the second, oops, sorry. Uh, look at that second winter. The British death rates go down to 2.2%. And the French death rates go up. Not quite as high as that first year, but very high. And the significant point is there was no fighting in the second winter of the war. The last battle was on September the 8th of 1855. The peace treaty was signed on March the 30th of 1856. And then the troops and their officers started to go home. So that whole winter, which was a time for a great deal of relaxation because there was no fighting going on, and the British, they cleaned up their camps. Dr. Sutherland and, Dr. and uh, Mr. Rawlinson, they'd cleaned up the hospitals, they cleaned up the camps, they cleaned up Balaclava, they'd done all that kind of work. And so conditions were very much better for the British in that second winter. And so here we have really the classic conditions for a controlled experiment, right? We have the same enemy, Russia, the same area, the same climate, roughly the same distance to get supplies from home, and the British do wonderfully, and the French do terribly. And uh, no, uh, uh, no coincidence that the French, when they, uh, they, they knew how bad their stuff was, and they credited the British government with making changes. The French did. Now, however, these data, which, I, uh, which are the basis of this chart, and the uh, data from the previous table, the British data were published by the War Office in 1858 but the French didn't publish their data till 1870. So uh, Nightingale and Sutherland did not know of the comparison in 
it, you know, in, in so many numbers, right? I mean, it was well known that the French were doing badly. I mean, you can see the number of burials that go on. Uh, they lost doctors. I mean, it was very well known that they had to get the Russians to sign a peace treaty because they were losing their army very badly. That was known. Now, uh, that's the really significant thing. However, this gets interpreted in a, in a variety of ways. And that, uh, that chart, incidentally, I haven't seen any British historians refer to anything of the sort. Uh, they've sort of looked at the British data, but not made the comparisons with France. French statisticians did, but not British. Nightingale and her team learned and applied the lessons of the war and radically reformed public administration very much improved hospital design and, of course, the creation of the new profession. Now, um, and, and that, that's the long-lasting legacy from that Crimean War. Now, sometimes Nightingale is given too much credit for what happened during the war. She's treated too positively. You see this from, uh, this is a doc, you see it sometimes by, by nurses. Within several months of her arrival, she implemented hygiene practices, use of clean water, clean sheets, and hand washing, well, clean water. No, she needed Robert Rawlinson to get the clean water going to clear out the dead horses and the rats. And that didn't happen until March. That was months later, you see. A good nursing care doesn't do anything if the water supply is polluted and there's no ventilation, right? So, uh, so that this is a generous thing to say, that's very nice, but it's not accurate at all. She kept extensive and accurate records of military hospital condition. She didn't at all. She was too busy working. She was too busy getting the laundries going. She was too busy getting kitchens going. Uh, she was too uh, busy buying clothing in, in Constantinople because the, the, the uh, army didn't have it. Uh, she was actually working on real conditions. She wasn't keeping track of that. But uh, her data analysis was done after the war, and it was based on official war office records. Uh, she didn't collect them at all, nor did she invent uh, triage. Now, so that's the excessive positive side. You also see excessively negative interpretations of Nightingale's work. Hugh Small uh, published a book in 1998 that claimed that the death rates were highest at her hospital. And this has been broadcast by the BBC uh, ad nauseum, and that she was to blame that she was actually criminally negligent. Uh, he did not provide one table or figure to document uh, his conclusion, and yet this, this has been taken up, it's become absolutely routine. Uh, he used rough estimates, and he compared by saying that the death rates were higher at her hospital, etc., cetera, and, uh, and at the general hospitals compared to the regimental hospitals. Well, I guess uh, the regimental hospitals sent their worst cases to the general hospitals. So this is a little bit like saying the death rates are higher in the intensive care unit than in the regular wards. Well, of course they would be, you know, just because of, of what their intake is. The mortality rate was high in all of the hospitals, but the highest, uh, and we don't have separate data for her, for her hospital, actually. So six to eight hospitals were grouped together, but some disaggregation can be done and we do, when we do this disaggregation, we see that the highest rate was at a hospital not even under her control. It was at the Kulili Hospital, a few miles from her hospital at Scutari, and it was one uh, nurse by the Irish Sisters of Mercy. And let's not blame them. They were not responsible for the terrible conditions uh, of the hospital to which they were sent. Now, this is a little bit... Uh, uh, this is Scutari, death rates here. This is, this, is, this is by time. I'm hoping I can make sense of this for you. And this, this is the combined rates. Then, then Kulili started, and you see the death rates go up. This is, uh, this is in January and so on. But then you actually get, so I've taken these last two. I've got this, uh, am I getting to the last two? Oh yeah, if you, if you look at these last two. These are the, the months that could uh, be disaggregated. And you can see that Scutari hospitals, and it's still a plural, it's high, but Kulili is even higher. And for the simple reason that it had the worst conditions. And you can read the detailed reports of the nuisance inspectors. The crud they took out of Kulili was, was even greater than at the other hospitals. Why the highest? Had the highest sanitary, had the worst sanitary conditions. And that's in the reports. It's right in Dr. Sutherland's report. It was well known at the time. 
a, a major cleanup was done, but, uh, and so the, the death rates went down at Koolili, but still the British government was very glad to give the hospital back to the Turks, you know, the, uh, it was because it was so bad. Now, so that there are lessons to be learned here. And I suggest what we really need to do is to look at how Nightingale drew the lessons from the Crimean War. You've got to get the science right. You've got, you've got to find out what is happening where. You get the best experts in, you get hard data, <coughs> official data, the best data, none of this, you know, these rough estimates that Hugh Small uh, used, and you review it very rigorously. The decline in death rates was not from nursing care. It required structural change sewers and drains especially. Nightingale understood this because uh, she was a, a very devoted reader of the Belgian statistician uh, Catelet. Different treatments have but a small influence on the death rate was one of the things that he uh, taught in his Physique Sociale. Administration saves more hospital patients than the best medical science. Nightingale's comments on reading that Physique Sociale. And it was Sydney, Sydney Herbert became her collaborator on actually improving things after the war based on the analysis done immediately after it. And this is Nightingale's tribute to Sydney Herbert on his death. He died in 1861, not long after. The war ended in 1856, and those ref the, the uh, Royal Commission and all of those reports were done very soon after. And then there, there was this intense period of implementation and this is what, uh, there was a significant change in public administration in the UK. Sidney Herbert was a cabinet minister. He personally chaired the four subcommissions recommended by the Royal Commission to bring in actual changes. And so this is Nightingale's tribute to him. And you see, here we get the relevant uh, English male population uh, and what their death rates are by, uh, uh, by type. And then this, these are army death rates. This is before the Crimean War. And this, this is how they were brought down, thanks to the changes made after the Crimean War. It's really quite a staggering difference. Yeah. Although it's not as, as big as the differences between the British and the French. Yeah. Knowledge for application. To compare results when neglected the laws of nature, I'm quoting Nightingale, and what we may expect from their observance. You just have to find out the causal relations, and then you can act. Nature is the same everywhere, a lovely constancy of nature, but does not permit her laws to be disregarded with impunity. This a contribution to the sanitary history of the British Army is a short paper of 1859 that highlights her 853-page uh, paper. You know, Nightingale thought she was going to die, and she, and she thought, I've got to have something with everybody's names and the dates, and who did what, and who failed to do what, uh, so that there can be some follow-up on these things. But she also got out the short things, which were quite persuasive, and her uh, famous charts are also in that. Now, at the same time, we're beginning to see, she started to work on surgical outcomes, and there were, the progress was made on that. The law of life after operations has not yet been ascertained. Uh, surgical deaths were certainly of the order, order 50% 50, 50 were quite routine. This is pre-antiseptic surgery. Um, Nightingale published on uh, safety of hospitals from 1858. Her hospital defects, there, she published so much on it, you start with four defects, then it goes up to 16 defects. I think you find 28 somewhere, and there's 11 somewhere else. Uh, but you can see there's a core message uh, in those defects. Uh, overcrowding, uh, deficiency of ventilation, deficiency of light, that's how it was expressed right, right back in 1858. And then it goes uh, on and on and on in detail. And here we get in her notes on nursing from 1860. This is this famous statement that uh, hand washing is absolutely key. And interestingly enough, uh, here we have a statement from 2004, and I think uh, experts in any country will tell you that hand washing is still the most important thing that uh, can be done to prevent uh, cross uh, infection. Now, her most brilliant charts, and uh, people, perhaps all of you, or certainly probably most of you, have seen her famous charts. There were three important ones that came out in her material. And what's so interesting about them, they're not your traditional pie charts, and she didn't invent it, but what she did with them is even more interesting. And that is, uh, it made it possible to compare cross-sectional with longitudinal data. 
Uh, this is the famous one. It's actually broken up into two. You see, it's, uh, you, you see the uh, death rates. Yeah. Oh, I'm not this getting through. And then this is when you get to this terrible winter. This is the first, win the first winter. And these big blue wedges are preventable diseases, these massive preventable diseases. Now, I think if you look at our analysis, you'd consider the, uh, uh, the non-preventable diseases also were preventable up to a, a significant degree, uh, but wounds not while the war is going on. But very significantly, see, this is where, uh, oops, uh, sorry, Th this is where the, uh, the Sanitary Commission began its work here. And you see you get, go from this big wedge to smaller wedges, and they keep going down and down and down. And so that's the difference that, that happened when you got these civilian experts, basically the best experts in the world, to come in to start making changes. And they did make changes, and those numbers went down. And Nightingale was a great believer. If you want to persuade people to do something, you've got to make it real and vivid to them, hence these interesting charts. I also like this black and white one a lot. Again, you start over here, and this is this big winter, these big, big wedges. Again, this comparison uh, is time. Each wedge is a period of time, and they keep going down. But the central circle is uh, hospital death rates in peacetime army hospitals. So these are healthy men, right? They're in the army. They've, they've, they've passed their way into the army. They've got to be young and healthy. And uh, uh, so that... Uh, the, the, the death rates actually uh, in the wartime hospitals in the Crimean War, they were brought down to w just simply being in Wellington Barracks in London. A really important change. And of course, no other army learned those lessons of the Crimean War. The French army, in its next war, the Italian Wars of Independence, where uh, Louis Napoleon uh, uh, sent uh, his army in 1859, only three years after the Crimean War, at Solferino, the dead and dying were left on the battlefield for days. They were not well prepared. Henri Dunant was there, and he went on to found the, uh, the International Red Cross based on, on what he saw, the, the terrible conditions he saw there. Nightingale gave advice to the Northern United States Army in the American Civil War. Uh, Harriet Martineau, who was a strong abolitionist, also acted as an intermediary on these things. And we know that her notes on hospitals uh, was used by both sides uh, during that war. The, uh, the big Confederate hospital just outside Richmond, Virginia, uh, was a, a hospital based basically on, on what we would call the pavilion uh, uh, approach. Nightingale concluded that if the Americans, meaning the, uh, uh, the North, had used her advice properly, their de hospital death rates could have been 3%. They were still very, very high. So they got some information, but they didn't apply it uh, as well as could have been the case. Then the next war after that is the Franco-Prussian War, 1870 to 71. Britain's not in it, but we have the same French army that was in the Crimea. And the French army death rates were 12%, although France declared war and, and Fr France had started it. And yet they have these pretty high death rates, not as high as their second winter of the Crimean War, but they're high, right? Uh, however, they are better than the, Pr the Prussian army death rates. They're at 20%, although the, Pr the Prussians won the war. You know? uh, I mean, so, I mean these are, so there's some anomalies here, right? Um, uh, the Pr Prussian doctors also went to Glasgow to uh, uh, see what Joseph Lister was doing in uh, antiseptics, uh, uh, which, which is interesting. But the British army did apply those lessons. Uh, the British government acted on the comprehensive recommendations of the official Royal Commission. Nightingale was acting behind it and, of course, throttling them all the way to get them to act. This was not easy to get people to <laughs> implement even the sanest and most comprehensive uh, of recommendations, but she was a very active backroom strategist and lobbyist. Uh, Sidney Herbert himself chaired those four key uh, subcommissions uh, to... Uh, uh, make changes, the Berrigan Hospital Improvement Commission, which later became the Army Sanitary Commission, and that was John Sutherland then became the ongoing uh, person. He was a civilian employee uh, of the War Office. He was not in the Army. They set up a new Army Medical School, an Army Statistics Department, so they could track disease, 
routinely, you know, find out where something's happening and if it's growing and do something about it fast instead of waiting to two years later when the, when the statistics come back to the war office. And an army cooking school, the nutrition was appalling. And uh, uh, that was one of the significant changes that were made. So we have, uh, this is China, this is Kowloon, it's uh, not, not uh, everywhere, but in the next battles that Britain was in, the reforms that were brought in have brought the death rate down to 3% a year, like Crimea in the second winter. And this, as Nightingale said, in a hostile country on the opposite side of the world, notorious for epidemic diseases. So again, this is simply showing that you do the right things, you make the changes, you introduce ventilation, you improve nutrition, you have clean water, etc. you bring down the death rates. It actually works. Uh, Netley Hospital and the Herbert Hospital, Herbert Ho Hospital in Woolwich, uh, now a very fancy place for a condo. Uh, they were both overbuilt because the beds were provided for 10% of the troops. The expectation was that 10% of soldiers would need to be in hospital. But with the reforms that were made in ventilation, water, uh, nutrition, etc., the, the morbidity rate went down and they only needed uh, beds for five to six percent of the troops. So as Nightingale said, it is not our fault if the number of sick has fallen so much that they can't fill their hospitals. And uh, Netley uh, wasn't filled until the Boer War, you know, like decades later, right? Now, Nightingale continued to work on the hospital issue. And uh, she did use strong language, which is one reason why we love her. It's, uh, it's, uh, it gets the point across, I know no class of murderers. You see, an ordinary murderer kills one, two, maybe a hundred if he's really got an automatic rifle, but a hospital architect can kill year after year. Some of these hospitals last a hundred years and, and can keep at it. It's, I mean, that's a, you know, a, a very uh, proper statement uh, to make. And so Nightingale advised on design, and the new St. Thomas, is when it was built, uh, and the Herbert Hospital in Woolwich, they became model hospitals of the new style, the pavilion style, which had been pioneered by the French. You know, the French uh, were, were very good at doing these things. And in effect, the, uh, do people know what, what these pavilions are? This is like this, uh, you see, you had to have, uh, you have people, you couldn't have single rooms because uh, there are no uh, electronic devices, no telephones, so the nurse had to be able to see everybody. So you had to have wards of some sort. So this is a long, narrow ward, and there's a bed on each side, and there are windows on each side, so you have cross ventilation. And then you see you've got a garden in between. And that meant that, that in effect, you had maybe like 30 or so, we'll say 30 patients plus doctors and nurses, uh, really vulnerable to cross infection. Uh, and uh, whereas the typical old style hospital, you would have hundreds of people, long corridor, all the wards uh, ventilating into the corridors. And so this is in effect, this is before germ theory was articulated, it's in effect uh, reducing the possibility of, of, of cross infection by, uh, uh, by this new model. Uh, here's another design. This was kind of a standard design for regimental hospitals. And it's simply, again, you get a bed on each side and windows and, and lots of air around. Uh, hospitals around the world follow this model. The Edinburgh Royal Infirmary, that's the, not the current one, but the, but the last one, the Royal Victoria Hospital in Montreal, Johns Hopkins uh, in Baltimore, the uh, Friedrichshain uh, City Hospital in Berlin, and when these changes began to be made, previously Nightingale would send experts who came to consult her. She'd send them to Paris to make the pilgrimage to La Boisière. And in fact, naturally, I made the pilgrimage to La Boisière. It's very easy to do. It's right by the Garden Noir. And it's still there, this uh, early pavilion hospital. But after St. Thomas's was built in Woolwich, the experts came to London uh, to, to see good hospitals. So for Johns Hopkins and all of those places, they came to London. Well, hospital statistics are key to saving lives. You've got to track them. You've got to use them. Uh, these are predictable. There are laws which regulate disease. You, you've just got to use them. I'm going to speed through this very quickly. Uh, would people like to ask a few questions if I uh, stop fairly soon? Okay. 
think. Yes, yes, yes. Okay. So, uh, so Nightingale did, Nightingale did a lot of reforms on, on, uh, on the subject, especially of workhouses. But whenever you do a reform, you've got to, you've got to keep the data. You have to monitor it. You've got to find out what was actually happening. And her chapters on notes on nursing, which she did after the Crimean War, they reflect what she learned. There are chapters on ventilation, light, and all of those things that reflect the lack of ventilation, the lack of light, the lack of nutrition. So you, we get this is all recycled into positives as to what you do better. And of course, it's this environmental theory because you've got to have the external, uh, you have to have those basics before you can do anything else. You may, may need political change. Uh, you may need all kinds of things. You've got to put the bedside care into that bigger uh, uh, context. Are Nightingale's methods still needed? Yes, I suggest that they, they are. And it's good to look at numbers, as Nightingale always did. Uh, hospital acquired infections, uh, all of these problems which continue. I'm a bit of a number freak myself. I worked on the tobacco issue. It's still the largest cause of uh, preventable mortality in the world, roughly six million deaths a year. Uh, so that uh, Nightingale said, you've got, you've got to look at these things. You've got to get some context for, for any work that you're doing. And I want to argue an ongoing relevance to healthcare today. And Nightingale's method is, what is part of her legacy. If, if you ever teach research methods to students, if you ever teach social policy, uh, it's still very good advice. She didn't call it the Nightingale method or anything, but if you look at what she actually did, that's what it was. And it's very, very effective. Nightingale method. And reports are not self-executive. You've got to have a strategy, a media strategy, a campaign, all that. She was an expert on that. Uh, one could go on for a very long time. Well, I'm going to turn it over to you and invite people to ask a few questions. And I'll just leave this up. This is, uh, uh, this is uh, there are not many pictures of Nightingale. Uh, this is one in Upper New York State, uh, at Chautauqua. And uh, she has a, an, an important following uh, in the United States. And so I thought it was interesting uh, to see that one. So let me invite some questions. And then I've got just a, a, a final slide to show you at the end. So if I could just, yeah. uh, on behalf of you, thank Lou first yeah. before we have our questions. Okay.